Hello, darling. This is Bubbles DeVere. Open the champagne because you're listening to a Burkham Wonderland. Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland and Arsenal podcast. I'm Guna Gimli and tonight my guests are... First up, he's ABW's producer and our answer to Chris Moyles. It's Danny the GFP. Hello, Danny. That's the nicest intro you've ever given me, sugar tits. Did you, uh, did you guess why I, I linked you to Chris Moyles? Is he... Because he's a big, fat, hairy bloke. <laughs> and he likes the radio. <laughs> oh, I'm a, fan, I'm a fan of the radio many hours a day. I prefer radio to TV most of the time. Okay. We'll move on. Go on then. Next up, he's the man that inspired Little Britain's only gay in the village character. It's Jason Davis. Hello, Jason. <laughs> you knew it was coming. <laughs> you cheeky turd. Oh, that's that's charming. We've got a big guest on, and that's the best you can do within the first 30 seconds. I, I'm being nice. I'm going to save my retribution for a little later. Well, that's fair enough. Right. Next up, he comes from a land down under. It's our injury specialist, Dom. Hello, Dom. Good day, boys. How are we all? It's, it's not too bad, thank you. And uh, what time is it with you? Uh, 18 minutes past three in the morning. Of course, no. It's, it's just amazing how you can stay up for this. No, I, I went to sleep early. I was being, I've been busy punching out the Zeds, but I'm, I'm awake now. Just as long as that's all you were punching out. No just... comment. <laughs> Ta-da, people, it's ta-da. <laughs> right, next up, quite possibly the biggest and most controversial free transfer since Sol Campbell joined us from the scum. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Guna Girl Kate. Hello, Kate. Good evening. And it's I a should, lady. should point lady. out, my spouse. My oh. spouse. Or better half. Much better half. I necessarily wouldn't <laughs> say better. Um, <laughs> right, and finally, at ABW, we pride ourselves on bringing you quality guests, and this week, I can We've not let you down. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the one and only Matt Lucas. Hello, Matt. Hello, how are you? Oh, not too bad. Do you know what? It's taken some time to get here. We know you're a busy guy, but oh man, it is an absolute pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, up the arsenal, as they say. There's no more you need to say. Um <laughs> Right, we'll jump straight into the action then and talk about Saturday's 2-2 draw against Hull at the Emirates. Um, to start us off, we'll go to Matt. So, Matt, can we have a, you know, a, a brief match analysis? I think, um, well, I had a lovely, yeah, that we can. So I got there a um, couple of hours early and I had a, a spot of, uh, I had some beef brisket. That was nice. And um, they did lovely potatoes, which were very nice, actually, very Moorish. And um, then I had some rumbles. I went, I did quite the poo. And then <laughs> I sat down and watched the match. And um, yes, well, it was a lovely goal from Sanchez. Let's knock that. that let's not knock that. That was a lovely goal. And, and we all thought, well, that's the first of many, I'm sure. And then, um, well... One of their players, I'm not going to name him because um, I'm not going to give him the. Uh, I'm not going to give him the. I'm not going to encourage the publicity for him. Um, was rather foully, and um, done a very naughty foul on one of our chaps, which I, I thought was really off. I thought that's not cricket, and um, then so they scored a goal, and our players were. Oh, she was livid. I saw her running over to the ref. She was livid. No, they were all they were all surrounding the ref, weren't they? Saying, "Don't give them a goal because he pinched me." And then, um, then it was the interval, and I had a lovely cup of tea and um, uh, a second much smaller poo. And then, um, second half, I thought, "Right, that's it. We you watch us go." But no, um, before most of the corporate people had even taken their seats, um, the Hull people had done a good goal. And um, uh, and I was a bit disappointed, really, at that point. But right at the end, Danny Welbeck scored. So that was nice. And I thought we were going to nick a winner, but we didn't. But last night we did. So that was nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was um, that was probably a little bit more in depth than I think any of us yeah, expected. Yeah, it was a very in depth. Yeah. Well, I um, I I I watched the match from a very technical point of view, and uh, I'm they don't call me Opta for nothing. And, um, well, it was a bit frustrating. It was a frustrating game, wasn't it? Because, let's be honest, you're at home to Hull. This is not a game that should end up as a draw, is it? No. I mean, um, 
one of the things that's been said about us this season is, uh, you know, the possession for that match was 66% and we only got a draw from that. It's been a bit of a reoccurring factor this season that we're having a lot of the possession, but we're not really getting the results. I mean, what do you really make of that, Matt? Well, I think, you know, I took an, an overall uh, view, to be honest with you, that um, the league is not going to be won by a team that isn't Man City or Chelsea, simply because, um, you know, we could, we, when we field our best 11, um, great, we're a match for everybody. But those two clubs have, you know, 22, 25 international players at their disposal. And I think it's often not about who you're able to play, it's who, who you're not playing, who's on that bench. And we don't have the the uh, the strength and the resources that they've got. And so, ultimately, we have to get out of our head the idea of winning the league. But we also have to get out, the, out of our head the idea that we're a failure if we don't, because I just think it's, you know, it's an insurmountable... You, you can't climb that mountain. It can't be done anymore. The game has changed. And so, although we're owned by a billionaire, he's not, he doesn't spend like a, a Russian or an Arab oligarch like they seem to do in football. So I think if you, if you think that the highest we can finish is third and we finish fourth, I think we do all right, to be honest with you. And I know that's a very negative, pessimistic way of looking at it, but um, I, I think, you know, we're realistic. And so that's what Wenger does every season. We, and it does feel a little bit like we're on a treadmill, we're just treading water, however you want to look at it. But I don't, I don't necessarily think that spending more money is, is the key. Uh, I think sometimes you feel like you want to see a bit more passion from the players, but I don't think it is that. I, I just think it's very hard for, for the players to have any kind of continuity because they, you, you never see the same team twice, do you? There's so many injuries and uh, it's, very, it's very difficult. Years ago, I knew who Arsenal's best 11 players were and I don't think we really know that anymore, do we? No, but then again, you could also say, does the manager actually know that? No, no probably not. Probably no. not. Um, we'll go to Jace next. And Jace, I want to pretty much ask you the same question. I mean, we're getting all this possession, but we're really grinding out results. I mean, what do you make of that? But Jace, just slightly shorter answer, please, because you're not famous. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not famous where? <laughs> no, fair point. <laughs> Trust me, I live in Wales. He ain't nobody. Yeah, I'm not, to be fair. Um, I, 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 judging my recent performances, you look at it, we got a lot of players who are on bald feet. We don't kind of get behind the defences. I know people play, teams are playing deep against us, but there's no explosive pace anywhere. You know, even though we've got players with great pace, etc., we're not stretching people. I think, you know, you know, you look at Gibbs, he's got mass he's got bags of pace. You know, when he stretches the line and you know gets gets himself going, he's a really dangerous player for us. But all too often is stop, come back, let's probe again. You know, now and again, I think you've just got to take a chance. And I don't think we do often enough. Uh, you know, Saturday was really disappointing. We 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 we're not we're not gelling like we should be, but um uh, until we got we got players running in behind the defences, etc., and making them think or shooting from range and putting doubt in, in opposition def- defences' minds. We're not going to get anywhere, you know. It's the same thing time and time again. You know, and we, and we missed a hat full of chances. I mean, Jack had a free header at goal, you know, <laughs> missed it. You know, it, it, it's at the end we had a couple of chances, but we were trying to push it a bit much. And... It was just, it was very frustrating. You know, I thought Welbeck took his goal brilliantly. Sanchez was great, but um, it was a frustrating day at the office. Yeah, it was a frustrating day. I'll give you that. But do you think, I mean, Hull played very played a very defensive match, didn't they? Yeah, but everybody's going to play like that against us at the moment because that's how you get results against us. So until we chop and change what we do and put doubt in other, in, in the other defences' minds... They're going to continue to do it. You know, you've, we've, we've got some talented players. We've got some top quality players. But, you know, they've, they've got to take a shot from 30 yards out every now and again. They've got to make that run behind the defence. You know, there's no point in just carrying on doing the same stuff all the time. You know, it, it, it's, it's like Groundhog Day. 
Mm. And and Kate, we'll go over to you next. Alexi Sanchez and Danny Welbeck, uh, do they really make the other players look bad with, with the amount of work rate they put in every game? I think Sanchez, he's a workhorse. I love Sanchez. He's never stops. He loses the ball and he chases after it. And I think we do lack that in a lot of our players. They lose the ball and then seem to lose heart or just can't be bothered maybe. I don't know. I don't think they make them look bad. I think the other players make themselves look bad. And and it's it's also the finger pointing out of the game. I mean, many people blame the, the poor refereeing decisions. Dom, where do you say it gets to the point where you've got to go, it's the players that are to blame? Because really, you know, you look at our squad, you look at whole squad, and I know we've got injuries, but really on paper, we should be outclassing them, shouldn't we? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a cop-out just to point blame straight at the ref. There was an awful lot of zig and not enough zag. In, uh, in the way that we've been going about things. I think we're a little bit like the Kardashians, aren't we? We're fun to look at, but we're really not that useful at the moment. <laughs> oh, it's another domism. So I, I, don't, I don't see it changing any time soon. I'm, I'm more sort of frustrated with the formation. I think that he's trying to accommodate Jack and Ramsey in the same team, and it's not really worked so far, and I'm not sure that it will. I'd prefer to go back to a, a 4 2 3 one and put Santi or someone like that in the number 10 spot. It worked last year. It all barred the big teams away. So I'm just not. I'm not really sure why we've decided to go away from that, other than to accommodate those two players that don't seem to really be hitting it just at the moment. But you know, you know what what he's like. He'll just keep trying it until it either doesn't work or one of them gets injured. One of yeah, exactly. One of them gets injured. Um, <laughs> It's it's hard. I mean, you look on paper, we had more than enough chances to win the game. So you know, blaming the refs probably just a little bit uh, that outlet for frustration. I think as soon as the game finishes. And How much that, uh, do you blame the manager more than the players? Uh, I don't know. That's, that's a, a fair analysis of it. I mean, Danny, this is a, another poor result for us, and and we're finding it hard to come by a win at the moment. Granted, you know that there's not many losses, but the wins are few and far between as well. Do you think after this result that the league is now out of our reach? No, the league's been knackered for ages. It's just really annoying because been been a man of the George Graham days, I can imagine once we saw that Diame bloke running at goal, Flamini going, oh no, he's touched me. And not, I mean, granted, he didn't fall down. But then um, uh, Mertesacker standing there putting his arm in the air. You can imagine George Graham sitting there chucking his size 10 tartan slippers at the TV, screaming, flat back four, arm up in the air, defend to the whistle. And what did he do? Oh, referee it's not fair he, he he did a push and he took the ball and no go in there two footed take the bloke out don't let him score play to the whistle and because of stuff like that George Graham used to always say you build the team from the back you start defensively and then you build forward but Wenger seems to be building the team everywhere but at the back I mean if he seems to be trying to dismantle the back as a as a one man um, tirade on defences, defenders, because uh, like we were, so were saying before, that when uh, Jose sends his muppets out to go and play, they all get a dossier on on what players and what positions and what that. And it's just been said that uh, Wenger just goes, "Go on, then out you go, play the game." And I think at times like that, it needs to. I always keep saying, "Flat back four, not flat back W," which is what it seems to be at the moment. Play to the whistle, and because of them constantly doing that, after eight or nine league games, our title challenge is over. But Danny, yeah. that's, that's the player's fault. That's not. That's not the coach. Well, if you were manager, Jays, would you when they come in? Would you kick them in the ass for doing that, or would you go? Oh, never mind. On on Saturday, okay. Yes, they didn't play to the whistle. That's fine. Okay, you know, they are to blame. There was a foul. They should play to the whistle. But you know, Murtasaka just made a mistake for the second goal. You know, he's just made a mistake. He gave up on the first goal and made a mistake for the second. You know, I'm a fan of all things German. Yeah, but and I'm know, not going to be mean about the bloke, the BFG, and he mucked up twice because he didn't yeah, play but, to the whistle. And just defensively, our team is a shambles at the moment. And I just wonder how long it'll be before Sanchez and Welbreck are brought down to the level of the rest of the team and not giving a damn, yeah, 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 or whether they're going to be able to bring the rest of the team up. Because even poor old Ramsey, one of your clan, even he was looking like he couldn't give a damn the other night. Well, that's that's a different game. Uh, you know, everybody played badly there. But you know, let's let's have a look at this in detail. Okay, you know you. They, nobody goes out to lose a game. These guys are professional footballers. You know, Per Mertesacker is a World Cup winner. You know, they, they just made a mistake. You know, it it shouldn't happen, but it does. 
Yeah, well, yeah. then just my point is, you should play to the whistle, and they don't. And as a world class yeah. World Cup winning defender, you should play to the whistle and don't stand there waving your arms because you think you've been hard done by. Don't but, do but, it. And yeah, he did it, and he shouldn't have done exactly, it. Exactly, I, I agree with you. But you're blaming Wenger for something which you know the play. You, once they pass the whitewash, that's it. It's down to the players. Yeah, but he should make it clear to them that he's not been known for his defensive uh, tactics, has he? It's go out there, give the ball to someone up front, and hopefully we'll outscore them. That seems to be the way it is lately. And Gim was asking, is our title chase over? And I said, yes, it is, because of defensive problems. And I'll not be... having enough defenders. Uh, really? I'd be interested to hear Matt's view on that. Matt, do you think our title chances are over for this season already? Yes. <laughs> That's fair enough. And another question <laughs> I wanted to ask you... <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, was Theo played his first game back from injury on Friday? What do you think he would have added to this game, and how much have we missed him? Well, I think I think we've missed him a great deal. Uh, his finishing has got better over the years, but as much as anything, of course, he's famous for his pace, and and we're sort of identifying how how when the game slows down, that's when Arsenal seem to lose their authority somehow. I think Arsenal. Wenger's teams play play well when they play fast, and and I think when teams come to the Emirates now, they they have so many players in defence, you know, because psychologically they can come and they can say to themselves, well, if we if we only lose by a goal or if we draw, we, we're fine, you know, we don't expect to win. So so actually, then then they're just happy defending. You know, it's like you know when you get a player sent off, you think, oh well, we now have to play a much more defensive game. You can't attack in the same way. And I think that's how teams come. And and actually, when you have the pace of someone like Walcott, that's exactly what you need. Uh, and that's what we were missing. And I'm sad to say that I think we wouldn't win the league. Uh, uh, but I I mean, I don't... On what grounds would you say that we would win it uh, based on what we've seen so far? You just... I think you'd just be deluding yourself. But but like I say, I'm I, I, when we say that every year... You know, and it gets earlier and earlier. And I mean, it's 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 sad, isn't it, in October to to sort of know that you're not going to win the league, you're not going to challenge, uh, or to believe that at any rate. As sad as that is, I think we delude ourselves because I I, I think you know. Do you think Aston Villa get to October every year and go, oh no, we're not going to win the league? No, because Aston Villa know they're not going to win the league, and but I think that's how we all need to think now. And I think unless you're Chelsea or Manchester City, that's how we all need to think. Just as it was Arsenal and Manchester United 10, 12, 14 years ago, it is now Chelsea and Man City. And and the gulf is far greater because, because of the kind of wealth that they have to play with. So what should Wenger do? Spend a hell of a lot more money? But he, I mean, unless you're going to spend what? Chelsea and Man City are going to spend. You, you're simply not going. To, you're not in with a chance. And I know we. Th- and I know Liverpool were close, but they didn't win anything last season, did they? They didn't win any trophies, no. unless I'm mistaken. No, and Man United didn't win any trophies last season, did they? Who won the Who won the League Cup last season? Was that Man City? I can't remember. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so, so you know, as much as we chastise Arsenal, well, Liverpool and Man United didn't win anything, and uh, Tottenham didn't come in with a anything either did they so so we we i think we feel because we were spoiled in the first half of Wenger's reign we feel that you know a slight sense of entitlement because we've watched the team go good and then we've sort of watched it all slip away so we feel that there's this thing that is within our grasp but i think we need to we need to reconsider this is no longer within our grasp as a club and that is that is until you know until the club is owned by somebody who will spend hundreds of millions of pounds you're not going to win the league that's just not going to happen and and you know we can all say oh well wow look at Real Madrid last night but Real Madrid have not been accountable financially for years you know those clubs got themselves in huge debt and then they then people came along and bought their training grounds for 300 millions of pounds didn't they and and weird things like that so I think you know we we can we just have to be realistic about it and that is that may well be depressing but there's something there's something liberating as well because you go well. Will we finish third or fourth? You know, will we have a good cut run? And I know, and maybe you think we're suddenly like minnows, but I think we are now. 
to be honest with you. I, I think it's a lot of uh, better the devil you know, isn't it? Because a, lo a lot of our fans take pride in going, we've done it the Arsenal way, we've done it the right way. We haven't gone out and, and got ourselves a, a super rich owner who's willing to just pump millions and millions and millions of pounds into the playing staff. And, and you've got the other side of the coin where people are going, oh, do you know what? I, I really want to win the league. I really want Arsenal to be successful. I really want to go out there and, and win things. But I think to a certain degree in today's game, you've got to have that superpower of a chairman or an owner there that's going to pump the money in to be uh, competitive with the other teams around us. And I, I think it's, you know, which one overtakes each other? Are you willing to lose your morals to be successful? Or would you rather keep your morals and just be, well, it sounds harsh, but also runs? I t to be honest with you, if you're looking at morals, then you're in the wrong sport. Mm, no, I, I totally I agree with the way that the club is going. Um, we'll move on then because I don't think really any of us really wanted to talk that much about Hull. It's one of those that's, you know, confines to uh, recent memory and uh, we'll put that in the cupboard. And, but and, do, and I, would say, I would say one thing, which is, you know, when Manchester United last won the league, they had this powerhouse goal scorer that we sold them. And uh, when Liverpool had their extraordinary run, you know, not taking anything away from Sterling and Sturridge, but we all know that it was Suarez that, that made that, that team, you know. So, so apart from this, you get one amazing striker every few years and you get lucky. To be honest with you, th th this has been for years Manchester City and Chelsea's league. And that's, that's what it is now. And until, you know, I mean, if, um, what's the chap called, the Uzbekistan man that, that read, uh, the red, red and white holdings? Usmanov. Yeah, unless, was, sure unless yeah, I mean, if Usmanov, you know, if they did a deal, then I suspect he probably would wield his money in the same way. Um, you know, but I think without that happening, and, I, and by the way, I'm not attacking, I'm not attacking the club for not spending that money because I think, I, I, who, you know, because anyway, and I don't even know what financial fair play, how that will affect things or whether that's, I mean, I think the amazing thing is the Man City loan, uh, getting Lampard on loan, because that looks to me like that was the plan all along, right? And that's, I mean, that's, mm. that is an amazing thing. So basically what Arsenal now need to do is to set up two other Arsenals in different countries <laughs> and then buy players there but, and loan them back to us. That's what we need to be doing. Did I read somewhere that Man City were actually into buying franchises? around? And I think the number quoted was about 10 of them in various different parts of the world. So they could farm out their players and buy their players and bring them back and move them around. And, and, and it's essential. I think football has become more of a business than it has been, you know, a, a pleasure, a pastime, you know, something that everybody enjoys to watch because, you know, we're, we're kind of all on the same level and the league's exciting where it's not. I mean, many people could have said league's going to be between Man City and Chelsea this year. Chelsea will probably edge it and where's the fun in that very much like Formula One a couple of years back everyone has said oh Sebastian Vettel's going to get around the first corner that's him won the race might as well switch it off but I will say that it used to be well it's going to be between Arsenal and Man United so we don't like it because we're not in that top two but I think there's, there's not usually more than two teams challenging for the league is there really no there's always two but I do think that, that, that it's not about teams anymore it's about clubs and, and I just don't think I think it's insurmountable now, unless you oh, join them. You're not going to beat them. Yeah, our chairman's yeah. richer than your chairman. Yeah. Can I just ask quickly, Matt, do you think that money has ruined football? It's not the same as it used to be back in the 90s. Look, I don't know. I don't think money has ruined football, actually. I think uh, money has changed football. Um, it's easy to say, to only look at the things that have changed for the worse but the truth is um and much as i loved highbury and there was an intimacy there that i think like the emirates is a nicer stadium it's more comfortable the facilities are better and and don't get me wrong that's not an, that's not a substitute for everything working on the pitch but if you if you take that away i like the fact now that we can see more games on television and i realize money is a is a factor there. So I don't, I don't think money is in itself the problem on its own. I just think Arsenal aren't doing that well. I think the truth is that actually um, you've got to be careful what you wish for, but I think 
Arsene Wenger had this incredible period of success at the club. And then the second period, the second half of his reign, has been about managing the move from one stadium to another. And he has done that incredibly effectively and responsibly. And we, in retrospect, may be more grateful to him than we are at the moment. Um, But I think we are all now getting a bit restless because people want that next stage. Now that we're in the stadium, people, you, you know, and that's, that's where, where you have to plan beyond Wenger because he's not going to be at the club for that much longer, is he? No. Um, we'll carry on proceedings by talking about last night's 2-0 win, uh, 2-1 win sorry, over Anderlecht. Um, Jace, would you like to kick us off with your match analysis on this one, please? Keep it brief. It was bloody horrendous, wasn't it? It was, um, well, Jack Rambo and Santi might as well not have been on the pitch. They were awful. We couldn't get a one-touch game going whatsoever. Um, the first half was dire. Um, when the second half, they scored a worthy goal, to be fair. I thought they deserved to be ahead. Um, we still couldn't get a go in. A couple of substitutions. We went very, Wenger went very positive. And lo and behold, two guys who'd, had, who'd done nothing all game um, in uh, in Gibbs and um, Chambers combined to score a cracking goal. I thought, he, you know, fair play to them. It was really well executed because up until then, they looked as if they had a stomach bug or something. They were awful. And um, Lucas Podolski coming on, you know, finishing off Sanchez's hard work and skill. To grab the winner, hell of an exciting ending, but um, uh, we got more than we deserved. But you know what? Sometimes you've got to take that. No, I agree. Um, Kate, Podolski came on to bag the winner, just like Jay said there. Do you think there's still a place for him in this team? I, not necessarily a starting place, but he's definitely someone who can come on and score that goal that you need at the end. I. I've always liked Podolski. I don't want him to leave. And I, I I believe Arsene Wenger came out after the match and said that he's going nowhere last night. But I don't think he's a starter, but, and that won't sit well with him because obviously, like was said earlier, he's a World Cup winner. He knows first-team football. But I did actually sit there and say to you, seconds before he scored, we'll get I another know. one and Poldy will score it. And you're like, oh, no, it's not going to happen. But he did. See, a bit of positivity, a bit of faith doesn't kill you in the end. No, seriously, and she's rubbed it in my face ever <laughs> since. Um, but it was a fairly boring game, and we really struggled to get going. I mean, why do you think we're struggling to fa- uh, excite the fans at the moment, Dom? Um, I had a little bit of a, a little peek through my Twitter timeline afterwards, and I saw a, an interesting little graph of uh, the average player position on the pitch, and it was... Um, basically you're back four and then everyone in the middle of the pitch. There was no width, there was no... Everyone sort of gets dragged into the middle and it's... I've noticed that before. Me and Jace watched a game earlier in the year. Uh, we were just having a chit-chat while we were watching. I think it was the Everton game. And we made the same kind of little observation with that game where the width, the natural width that Theo provides or that um, you might get from a proper left-sided winger, we don't actually have. Everyone's drawn into the middle and we're trying to run through blind alleys and pass our way through through defences, um, like you said, with the whole game. And I think Arsene said it after this game as well, that Anderlecht um, defensively set up quite well to stop what we do. And, you know, like Jay said, that's what teams are going to do because they know that that's how they can get results against us. So they need to start spreading the ball around a little bit more and getting out into those wide areas and spreading defences a little bit because I think we're making it too easy for people. We're too predictable. Mm. And Danny, did you see Paul Merson after the game? Oh, bless his socks. I was saying in the WhatsApp group last night that for, for all these years that Arsenal been fantastic, he's been, oh, come on, Arsenal, Arsenal this, I love Arsenal all that lot. But as soon as Arsenal are rubbish and Chelsea are good, oh, I've been a Chelsea fan my entire life. <laughs> yes, I did see him, the but, but cheeky little scroat. Does he speak for the fans with his downbeat assessment of last night's game? I mean, the, I mean, you could be forgiven for thinking that we'd actually lost that game if you'd listened to his analysis. Well, I think he's you, you, you're playing to the the Twitter massive that love to um, be down on Arsenal, be down on everything we do. When the history books will show that that game was a win, and that's all that matters. I mean, I felt really down about the entire game. I thought that we we 
we uh, I mean, it's nice that, obviously that we've won but I thought sometimes you need to lose for the players to realise how badly they've played but I didn't want them to lose but there are so many people on Twitter that, that have an agenda that they want us to lose every single game until Wenger's out of the club and then they go ah now we're a mid-table club with massive debts we're not in Europe and uh, I think that's the kind of people that Merson was playing up to Mm. And Matt, even though a win is a win and this will go down as a poor result, as Anderlecht are a shadow of the club they used to be, I mean, 2-1, I know it's a win, but is it really a bad result? Um, well, everyone was talking up Arsenal's, you know, the likelihood of Arsenal having a, you know, scoring many goals. But it is a good result because um, we were not on good form and... We were on course to lose, and we got two very late goals. So it's a good result. But no, it wasn't a great performance. But also, you know, Saturday was a great disappointment. Um, and before that, so maybe it's one of those results that just stops the rot. That's sometimes what happens. You get the rub of the green, as they say, and then suddenly, you know, fortunes change. It'd be very interesting to see what happens on Saturday because obviously Sunderland just let in 49 goals in their last game. And uh, so it'd be really interesting to see whether, they, whether they're actually quite hard to play against. Um, uh, I think that's going to predict- work. Yeah, predictions, it's got to be something like, what, Sunderland probably seven, Arsenal 13, I reckon, something like that. You know, defences have both predicting been a, shocking. I, I'm predicting another draw in that match because I think Sunderland have everything to prove after that game. You don't want to play a team that has just lost 8-0. You don't. You don't, no. because they're going, to be, they're going to come out ferocious. Mm. And, and I would imagine that Poyet would have them absolutely chomping at the bit against us. Um, but, Jace, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, Gibbs finish for the equaliser. World class, surely. Alexi Sanchez would have been happy with that finish, wouldn't he? Oh, the boy buried it, didn't he? Fair play to him. I, I, he w- I found I find Gibbs one of the most frustrating players on the books of this. I just he's got so much talent, he's got so much pace, and when when he attacks with you know with intent, he's magnificent and his finish just proved it. He just doesn't do it often enough. Do you yeah. know what I mean? He, yeah. he the guy needs to get a little bit more arrogant, he needs to back himself and he needs to attack that back post more often than he does. But um uh, fair play to him, cool as a cucumber. He, it was it was a world class finish. It really was. You know, yeah. we, we 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 were fortunate to see, regardless of what went before, two great finishes to win us that game. Mm. You know, because I thought Podolski as well, one touch bang. You know, there's a lot of people around him. The balls come to him in a difficult area, and he's just he's just nailed it. Fair play to them both. He's just, just buried it. Yeah, um, another defender. Uh, Don, we'll go to you. Uh, Monreal at centre back. Surely we're in trouble because he didn't have the best game last night, did he? No, it's, it says a lot that he'd rather play Monreal at centre back than have Chambers there and put um, oh, what's the young uh, Bellerin at right back. So, Bellerin's, can I just say, on, sorry to interrupt, but on Saturday, right. Bellerin was our best player by a country mile. But he was, he was, yeah, he was absolutely fantastic, and that's that's what surprises me. That you know, it does say a lot that he'd prefer to have. Chambers at right back with Monreal at centre back, then have Bellerin at right back with Chambers in at centre back because Chambers would be a better centre back than Monreal, surely. And um, I'm not sure that it's sort of cost us, so to speak, but it it that, that doesn't help. I don't think it gives it doesn't give the back four much confidence when it's chopping and changing all the time, and you've got different personnel back there all the time. And I think the best run that we had defensively last year was when it was the same back four selected every week. Uh, I think the inconsistency with the team selection because of the injuries and things, that's why I'd prefer to just to give Bellerin a go at right back and to play the same back four for a few games to let them settle, to let them get used to each other's movement a little bit. And I don't think it does us any, it doesn't do us any favours having different personnel, more so than maybe Monreal being there, I'm not so sure. But it, it's a worry. I mean, we're definitely short. In, in that position, and we're not really too sure when Koscielny's going to be back with his Achilles problem. That's just going to be one of those one of those injuries where it's only going to be time that that can uh, that can stop it from flaring up. So it is a bit of a worry the back four, but I think we all saw that coming. 
Yeah. And, uh, of course, Martinez last night between the sticks, uh, deputising for Chesney. How did he do, Kate? I actually think he did really well. We didn't expect him, well, I didn't expect him to play quite so well. I didn't know too much about him. And I know there was a lot of talk on Twitter about, is it Ryan Hubbard? Is it that was on the bench? Is that H- what it's called? Hudart. That's Hudart. the one. I knew it was something like that. But, and everyone's going, oh, you've got to wish him luck. But no one actually expected him to come on. But Martinez, I actually think, played really well. He didn't, he couldn't have stopped the first goal. That wasn't his fault. But the saves he did have to make, he did well. And it was surprising and I guess quite pleasing to know we've got someone there that can fill in if we've got Chesney missing and we've got Ospina missing. Mm. And uh, is there anything else anybody wants to chip in on this one um, before we move on to the Q&A with Matt? Yes, I think Bellerin has nice hair. (laughs) I think Giroud has nice hair also. Um, yes, got... that, I agree, yeah. Dom, <laughs> um, noticed that Wilshire had some strapping on one of his thighs last night. Is that something you need to worry about? No, I wouldn't think so. Was it the kinesthetic tape or was it the just around and around in circles tape? Could have been in gaffer tape for all I know, I don't know. It was going from, <laughs> no, from I wouldn't, top I wouldn't to be bottom. too worried. Like I've said before, players go into games all the time with knocks and you know a bit of tightness or something like that and... Um, you know, people have sort of questioned Aaron Ramsey coming back and and wondering whether it was too soon or not. And the players aren't going to go out there and play if they're not able to go out there and play. So I wouldn't be too concerned with Jack at the moment, no. And he, he, um, I'd be more concerned about the 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 hit that he took with his knee, the against Hull, than than anything. But if that was fine and he got through the game, I wouldn't be too concerned. One one last thing from last night in my, my uh, memory of the game is just as the ball come in, Monreal tracked to left back with, the, with their player, their player crossed the ball. And if you, I've got the picture in my head, Monreal tackling at left back with this bloke just before he crosses the ball and Gibbs is standing in the background going, hold on a second, I'm the one playing left back. And that, that, that look on Gibbs's face was, uh, it was a cross between shock and awe and disgust. So that's what I take away from the game last yeah, night. But, yeah, but why, why wasn't Gibbs there? You know, Monreal was there. No, no, they were both on him, and and Gibbs let him go. Uh, Gibbs, just, Gibbs, Gibbs is a habit of doing that. Well, Gibbs was a striker, wasn't he, as a youth what's player? A, I what's, thought he was a winger at uh, uh, Wimbledon. What's we're all winners. On a uh, oh, set piece again. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> Cheeky. What, what's that, Jace? What's everyone's thoughts on our set piece again? We don't have them, Dead. do we? No, no, you know, Santi has got a return rate of one goal in the final. <laughs> from 18,000 set pieces. God, oh, Arsenal, Arsenal um, uh, don't score from corners, do they? One, I reckon we could get one goal a season from a corner. I think we'd be lucky to get one, to be fair, Matt. I think the last decent corner we had, taker we had, was Steve Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Precisely. Left midfielder, we sold him to Luton after we won the League Cup. You probably remember him, Matt. What year was that? I remember him. And he, he fell out at Southampton. That's it. And so he had to come to... Uh, and, of course, the story in Perry Groves' uh, uh, book was that uh, he was very rude to George Graham and, and nobody could believe it. And George Graham didn't do or say a thing. And everybody couldn't believe it. And then a few weeks later... He simply left Steve Williams out of the lineup for that cup final, and that was his means of revenge. Um, he, he wore a, he wore a headband sometimes, didn't he? Or was that Steve Foster? A Steve Foster. I remember him. Did, I, yeah, old fuzzy. Yeah. I, I can remember Stevie Williams. He was he was a bit of a hard man, wasn't oh, he? He wouldn't he was, want to mess with him. Yeah, he had attitude. Yeah. Did you like Perry Groves' book then? Of all the Arsenal biographies, I think that's my favourite. Yeah, that's my favourite as well. It's, Brilliant. Um, very candid. I tell you, I wish Lee Dixon would write a book. He is, he's so, he's such an intelligent man and very, very witty. And I think if he ever did, it would be great, I think. I was just going to say, Perry Groves is going to be on this show on the 6th of November or the 7th of November. Uh, you go from, well, actually, he, he looks quite like me now, doesn't he? He's a little <laughs> chubby top, doesn't he? <laughs> no There's more to love. Yeah, give, him my, give him my love, please do. Well, if you're around, feel free to join us. What's the date? Seventh of November, I believe. If I can, I will. Oh, that'd be oh, lovely. Superb. See, we're all ABW friends here. Matt's now just—he's one of the crew. Um, 
can, well, Karen... can I just sorry? Can I just say one thing that I take away from a lot of the matches that we play, and I've said it before. But we play beautiful football and Arsenal has been known for playing beautiful football for so long. It's getting us nowhere. Sanchez plays some amazing footwork, as does Welbeck when he's playing well. But maybe it's time to play ugly, to win a match ugly and just get three points rather than trying to do the beautiful football. Oh, we do play ugly. Have you yeah. seen Per Mertesack? Oh, you mean... <laughs> sorry. sorry, the ugly style. Sorry. Um uh, yeah, well, well, no, I think that's the thing. And, and, and actually, all the great teams, even Man United, knew how to just scrape those ugly goals right at the end, didn't they, under Ferguson? And, and that is, that. It, it, yeah, I agree. Sometimes I wish, I mean, it would never happen in a million years, but I would love it if Wenger brought George Graham in to coach the defence. Because one thing George Graham's defenders did was they scored goals. You know, uh, Tony Adams used to score those cheeky headers right near the end of the game. And I would love, I would love ugly goals from our defenders. You know? Look at Steve Bold in this, the um, Cup Winners' Cup semi-final against Sampdoria. We were 1-0 down. He comes, he gets two goals. Beautiful That's it. stuff. And, and Martin Keown was ferocious. He would scare the ball into the net. <laughs> he'd, he'd ugly he'd, it in. No, <laughs> oh, no, I love Keown. He is a... A well-spoken. He never would have thought he'd be such a well-spoken, intellectual, intelligent commentator on football, would you, back in the day? No, I would, because we were at Eton together, so I would. Was he at yeah. Eton? No. I'm talking... <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's you've... Oxford people for you, Danny. We're all the same, all intelligent, well-spoken. Oh, behave and yourself. Polite. And polite, yeah, exactly. That's an oxymoron, um, if ever I've heard one. You're an oxymoron. <laughs> Oi. Um, seeing as we have Matt on the show tonight, we're going to do a bit of a and a if that's OK, Matt. Yeah, go for it. Superb. Right, my first question for you is how did you get into supporting Arsenal? My late father was a big Arsenal fan because when he was about 14, he had a terrible accident on his push bike. He went forward over the handlebars and they thought uh, his injury was so bad, there was was even a chance that he might not walk again. He, He was really... Uh, broken up by this accident and uh, the, a doctor who operated on him happened to be this was in the late 50s he happened to be the doctor to the Arsenal team and while my dad was recovering he used to give my dad uh, tickets free tickets to Arsenal uh, to watch the matches and so it's something that we inherited from from my late father and uh, I remember being maybe s- seven years old in 1981 he took me started taking me to Highbury, me and my brother. And, uh, yeah, so, so it's been since then. Wow, that's incredible. Um, right, next one. Uh, Favourite all-time player and why? David Rowcastle. And I would have said this before he died. Um, he gave everything. You, just, you didn't ever see a distinction between him and the club. Somehow he just embodied all of that hope when George Graham arrived. In about when was about eighty six, mm. and you know that whole that whole group of young players that were coming through. Merson, maybe Merson was a little bit later, but Niall Quinn, Tony Adams, David Rowcastle, Michael Thomas, uh, all those all those brilliant young players. Martin Keown that were coming through the club at, at that time, and also I remember being quite proud at that age that Arsenal was did seem to have a higher ratio of black players in their team. I remember seeing Chris White there and Paul Davis and Raphael Mead and Viv Anderson before that when I was very young. And that did stand out to me. Um, it was always used to, it was always one of those strange things that Everton didn't have a black player for ages, did they? And so he represented something about a sense of inclusion at Arsenal. And he gave, he just gave so much on the pitch and um, scored some wonderful goals. That, that goal against Middlesbrough always stands out. And I was so upset when he, he was sold. But from, from a footballing point of view, Graham knew that, that, that uh, uh, he was past his best. And, you know, he was ruthless, George Graham, wasn't he? And yeah, he um, was. it was so sad when he left. And, oh, my God, the day he died, I was in buckets of tears. And I have to say, we played Tottenham the day uh, he, he died. And there was a minute's silence, and every single Spurs fan observed that. And I always remembered that. I thought that was very respectful and, and uh, appreciated that. And, uh, yeah, he goes down as my favourite ever player. And you couldn't argue that he was better than... Righty or or Dennis or anything like that. You don't need to. That's not the point. He's my favourite player. 
No, just someone that's someone that's personal to you that you yeah. know you had had a, um, a moment with or enjoyed watching. That's that's what it's about, and that's what is football is all about. Um, my next question: uh, A lot's been said about Arsene Wenger, and as fans, I think it's fair to say we're fifty-fifty about him still being manager. So, where do you stand, in or out? You know, fans are fifty-fifty, and I'm fifty-fifty on it. You know, it depends what what. I can't, I can't, I can't uh, give you my opinion because I go, I go from one to another. You know, I think what he's done for the club is incredible, um, and uh, you, you, one is not a hundred percent sure if if he's managed to change with the game. He did change the game, but now it feels like the game might be going off in a different direction. But then, like I say, you know, if Wenger leaves, we could, we could finish tenth. Mm. You know, and and so I don't think we can. It's, although it sounds strange, I don't think we can judge Wenger yet. We can't judge this period yet. You know, if if Wenger left and Klopp came in or Ancelotti, then then we'd get more of a sense of of actually what that job is. But Arsenal is one of the least transparent clubs. You know, you you, you they never announce. You never hear what the transfer fee was. You never. You know, they're so guarded and that's you know and there's obviously reasons for that I'm not attacking the club I think it's probably it's, it's reasons of elegance and old style class as much as anything that there are certain things that you don't talk about publicly but consequently we don't really know what the finances are at the club not really and we don't quite know what Arsene's job entails frankly so we can't I can't quite tell if he's doing an amazing job given the restrictions or if someone else could present a, you know, a case for them doing the job. I can't, I just, so where do I stand? I just don't know. I really don't know is my honest answer. What no, about you? Not. I bet you've um, all got strong opinions. We have, on this show, we've, in the last couple of months, we've done, we've got Jeff, who is a massive, massive Wenger in, and we've got Gav, who is a, a, a Wenger out, and, and they go at each other, and do you know what, you, you kind of sit here as host, and you think, do you know what, they both make such wonderful, wonderful points, and I think when you boil it all down, you think maybe he's not doing a good a job as, as he could be, however, you can't, and, and you can't sit there and slag a man off that's done so much for the football club, and, and the transition, and, and going from Highbury to the Emirates and just it is one of those you just you're just speechless on it really um but my next question for you would be you know Wenger's time will inevitably come to an end who would you like to see replace him when that when his time does come up Tim Sherwood Tim Sherwood no of course not um (laughs) uh I'd Klopp 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 has Klopp has the passion Clock. But he is, they are having an awful run in the Bundesliga at the moment. Do you think Klopp great. is good enough? Yeah, great. Bring him in then. Great. He'll want a new challenge. Bring him in. Yeah. I love, oh, I love Klopp. The look passion. At, yeah. Look at him jumping up and down like a little clockwork soldier. I love him. He's like a, oh, he's wound up something. Oh, I love him. I love him. I love it when they care. I like the managers who are punching their fists. I used to be so envious, actually, sometimes, watching Alex Ferguson, watching that red face, sort of watch him punch the air when, they, when they'd when they score a late goal. And I'd think, I want a manager who does that. I want a manager who, who hugs and shouts and rants and raves and feels it and wants it. You know, I want to see the passion, and that's what you get with Klopp. Or the other way is, is uh, obviously, uh, Ancelotti would, would, would be probably the the most popular choice, wouldn't he, I would think? Guardiola? Well, Guardiola, yeah, but I think Guardiola's already come out and said he wants to go to Man United, hasn't he, now? Oh, I don't know, we can't have that. But I think with with Wenger, it's the, if we have a poor first half, you don't get the impression that he's going to take them all into the dressing room and kick some ass. It's like, no, think, oh yeah, they're all going to go and have half-time oranges and a little bit of a shoulder rub and then be pushed out for the second half. Look, we don't know, really, what's going on inside there. Um, but... Uh, 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 there are some things there, there's something one senses with Benga that he because he lives in an age where there's so many statistics you know these opta statistics and I wonder if sometimes he really does 
just take all of those statistics into account. Like he must have read a statistic somewhere that says, um, don't do any substitutes until there's 15 minutes left. And so many other managers would say, no, I'm going to shake it up at half time. But he rarely does that, doesn't he? He has a thing at about 70 minutes or 72 minutes. You maybe see someone come on and sometimes it's too late for them to change the game. And I, and I wonder, you know, Wenger 10 years ago, when he seemed to be so much more powerful, probably had less statistics at his fingertips, less information to digest. Maybe it was just easier then. Maybe he was more instinctive and intuitive. And now he's trying to take on board, you know, all these studies and stats. And I don't, I'm not sure how helpful they are because actually football is full of aberration, you know, uh, and and coincidences and things that go wrong. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, you know, Chelsea would have won every single game and they don't win every single game. And if you listen to someone like Dave Hillier, who comes on our show, and and he is massively stat orientated, he's like, uh, you know, the amount of forward passes, the amount of ground covered, and and he, I think, he, is he about to do a show at Arsenal, or he does do a show at Arsenal based on the stats, Danny? Yeah, he certainly does. It's um, the Arsenal assessment, I think it's called. But it's, it's very, very interesting to him when he talks about Arsenal, and and you see like the players that maybe don't necessarily get the credit for doing the work, yet the, the, the touches on what part of the field or the passes that they make and the amount of touches they have is very interesting stuff. Um, I'll move on to my next question for you. Um, do you think our inability to buy the players we, we need in the positions we need to strengthen in has seen us unable to compete this season? No, because I don't think... No, I don't think it's that, because I think the manager has a, a definite policy to sort of his his big interest seems to be the midfield, right? Mm. And the attack. I don't think it's an inability to buy defenders. We had the ability, I'm sure, to buy Fabregas. Uh, although, what, what, I'm not necessarily sure we had the ability to pay him what he would have been able to command elsewhere. So that might have been an, 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 an issue to do with him not returning. Um, although I have my own theory that maybe it wasn't an amicable leaving and therefore, you know... I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But I don't know. We can buy defenders. He just, I just don't think it inspires him. I don't think he's that interested in it. I don't think he ever was. He's never been into defenders. He inherited a brilliant back four. And he was shrewd enough to replace them with, you know, uh, Campbell and Laura and what have you. But it just doesn't, I don't think he's interested in the defence. Um, you know, when little boys watch football, they're not interested. Nobody wants to be a defender, do they? No. Never wants to be an attacker. Well, I think he's like that. It just I think he always thinks, well, if we score more goals than them, then we'll win. I don't think I don't think it ever bothers Wenger that we don't have a clean sheet as long as we win. No. That's a very, very interesting analysis on it and not necessarily the answer I would have expected you to say, to be honest. Um what, what were you expecting me to say? I, I thought you would have said something like well, defensively, we're short and we didn't buy the defenders that we needed and we didn't have the the cover to, say, you know, maybe to cover Mertesacker or, or Kashani. So we would have been short in those positions and we've had to juggle the defence. A lot has been have made of, what, six players to cover four positions and it not being enough. Hence why we're playing Monreal at centre-back. I, I thought that would you would have gone along the lines of that. Well, I think the problem as well is that, you know, like I say, I, I suspect he is overloaded with stats and, you know, he's looking to buy a defender and then he'll look at their stats and think, oh, well, I'm not sure, you know, they, they, they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And you think, yeah, but that's their stats at that club. You know, you haven't seen them at Arsenal where it could be different. So I think, I think he's quite cautious when he buys and, and he probably just reasons from an economic standpoint, you're better off buying a Sonogo who's less of a, you know, because if Sonogo fails, nobody's going to say how dare you spend 20 million and it's failed because it hasn't got 20 million, has it? But it was, no. it was an odd situation, actually. Not, I'm not talking about the, the uh, attack. But uh, I mean, this is, it was an odd situation. I, I was at Wembley when, when uh, we were losing to Hull and he brought Sonogo on. And I, and I thought, goodness me, you know, here we are in an FA Cup final and we're bringing and we're losing and we're bringing on a player who has yet to score for the club as a striker in an FA Cup final. Uh, and I remember thinking that is, a, that is a very unusual state of affairs. So I don't think it's just defence here. 
I think we could probably include the attack. I think what inspires Arsene Wenger is the midfield. That's that's his thing. The midfield. No. The whole game should be played from the midfield, right? Yeah, no, I suppose it's a very fair analysis. Um, if you were Arsenal manager... Well, I am. Three... <laughs> we wish, Matt, we wish. Um, if you were Arsenal manager, what three things would you do to make the club title challengers again? Oh, interesting. I think, um, given our resources, uh, or lack of them, I think it would have to be more to do with sabotaging the opposition. So um, I'd find whatever chef... Um, uh, uh, cooked for Tottenham that night all those years ago and gave them all food poisoning and I'd, I'd, I'd hire them to prepare a lovely pre-match snack for the opposition players Always, it's always in the room ready for them before every game that would be the first thing um, I'd probably um, you, know, you know when you're at school and then the ball goes on the roof that's it you, you yeah. can't play anymore. So I'd probably go send someone to Stamford Bridge and kick the ball on the roof so they can't play. <laughs> then, they, then they won't get three points. And then um, I'd, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably um, send Christian Gross back to Tottenham. I, I, I think that's perfectly fair. <laughs> yeah, that's the third one. I think we should all have a whip round and make it happen. Well, it was so entertaining, wasn't it? Oh, it was it was fantastic. I mean, they've had a, a host of poor managers. They seem to go. Um, they seem to go experienced international manager, and then and then when that fails, they go to you know a lesser known English manager, and then when that fails, they go to someone and they give him lots of money. It's just like a, a, a circle of excuse my French shit. Um, my final question before I hand you over to Danny and Jace, who have got Facebook and Twitter questions. Um, we've been told there's 50 million to spend in January. Now, what players would you bring in with that money? Cesc Fabregas. Oh, do you know what? FK, probably somewhere. You don't know FK, but he's probably listening to this somewhere, probably touching himself. Probably. Um, uh, yeah, it kills me to see him at Chelsea. It kills me. You know, I, I, you saw that goal that he scored at the weekend and, and there was part of me that sat there and thought, do you know what, he should be doing that for us. He should be doing that for us. And it's gutting. Yeah. It really is yeah. gutting. I mean, and you look at them down at Stamford Bridge and they've gone out and they've bought Diego Costa and Seth Fabregas. Those two players have hit the ground running to the point that single-handedly they will win Chelsea the league. And in know, a way, go on. Well, the other player I'd buy is Harry Kane from Spurs just to annoy them because they all think he's the great new thing. <laughs> Or just to wind him up, I'd buy him and bench him, to be honest. Somebody ever put on Facebook or something like that, Harry Kane, the new David Bentley. Oh. <laughs> oh. I don't know what I'd do in the back just for a laugh. I don't know what I'd do. I'd buy, um, who would I buy? I'd buy Fabregas, I would. I don't know why we didn't buy him. Well, I do, because of Ozil, I suspect. But, you know, I bet you Chelsea could have bought Ozil and Fabregas. They'd have gotten both, wouldn't they? And that's Probably. the thing. Yeah. yeah. Right then. Um, thank you so much Ashley for answering Cole. all my questions. Oh, let's buy Ashley Cole. That would be hilarious, wouldn't it? Oh. Ashley Cole off. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm just indulging myself now. Carry on. You, you sounded like you were having an away moment, like when you were looking up to the sky and you were just picturing the possibilities. I'd like to, I'd like Ashley to see Ashley Cole back at Arsenal just for a laugh, just to wind everyone up. <laughs> That's fair. Um, Danny, I'm now going to hand over to you and Jace. Oh, that was smoothly done. Right, we've got to uh, start off with a, a funny question that we've mentioned before the pod started from Steve. Do you think Mario Balotelli uses Precious Little, the coffee lady from Come Fly With Me, as a role model for his work ethics? Oh, I don't want to get involved. I do, I do feel sorry for Balotelli, though. I do feel sorry for Balotelli because talk about, you know, oh, oh yeah, come to Liverpool, you're replacing Luis Suarez. <laughs> Off you go. Off you go. Good luck. Hiding something, isn't he? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> so, uh, Jace, have you got one? Are you yeah. organised this week? Because last week I come to you and you kept going, oh, I have got one. Yeah, because you didn't let me know you were Oi, oi. I'm all, I'm don't start getting stroppy. <laughs> I'm deported. I'm all over it. Okay, oh. Matt, on the Facebook page... We put a picture of yourself up with Thierry Henry. 
um, to advertise today. And Gaz has wants to know what does Thierry Henry smell like? Um, he smell well. I don't know. I've not smelled him. That would be peculiar. <laughs> Gaz is peculiar. I'm not gay, I'm not, yeah, I'm not gay <laughs> and I'm not interested. I don't know. I should think he smells very nice. I should think he's a charming young man and a marvellous ambassador for the club. I think he might end up being Arsenal manager one day, actually. I've got a feeling. That would be nice. Okay, right. One from AFC Glenn. Nice and simple. Henri or Wright? Oh, love them both. Um, The stats... Oh, Henri. And I love Ian Wright. But it's got to be Henri, hasn't it? It has to be. Well, oh, that's the, the Gallic of... nonchalance. Yeah, it has to be. <laughs> and he smells so good too. <laughs> he smells yeah. of money and success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's got to be Henri. Sorry, righty. Go on in, Jace. Right, uh, Robert Manoni. If you could replace, if you could add one car- player to the current squad, who would it be? The player can be new or an old one. Up to you. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I'd bring back... So it could be an old one. Yeah. Um, do you know, and this is going to be controversial, I'd bring back, at his peak, David Seaman. That's not a bad idea. At his peak, he was amazing, wasn't he? Oh, th- that's saved against Sheffield United. You know. Yeah. I mean, up like a I mean, keeper. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. I'm trying to think of. Uh, oh, here we go. Go for a funny one. From Steve Walbridge. If George, George Dawes was a football player, what position would he be? <laughs> oh, blimey. Um, uh, well, no, he wouldn't. He'd be in the stands banging one of the. Oh, God. Banging a drum. That's what I hate about <laughs> playing. You know, when like the Germans come over. Oh, God, and they'd bang their bloody drums. He'd be one of them, wouldn't he? Banging a drum in the stand. No, he wouldn't be playing. He's too fat like me. But he'd be banging a drum and being really annoying. That's what he'd be doing. Nothing wrong with being fat. I'm 18 and a half stone, and it's all love. (laughs) Got (laughs) legs to muscle. (laughs) Oi, cheeky. But not speed. That's it. I'm all neither in my case. (laughs) Uh, Right, go on, Jace. Okay, um, Joshua Kennedy. What team do you love seeing us beat the most? Well, this is a tricky one because you want to say the obvious one is Tottenham, but um, I think in recent years, probably Chelsea because Tottenham are like, beating Tottenham's like, it's like, you know, it's like kicking a child. It's not fair. <laughs> you know, you don't do that. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's cute, but irrelevant. <laughs> beating Chelsea is, is good. Yeah. I'm going to say Chelsea. Nice. Okay, right, Carl says, how will Wenger be remembered for his time at Arsenal and does he hold too much power at the club? Well, I, like I say, I think it's a mystery. I don't know how much power he holds at the club. Um, we can only presume how much power he holds. I think he'll be remembered as somebody who uh, had extraordinary success in the first half of his reign and masterminded a transition um, uh, from that world to a world where oligarchs and shakes took over the sport and where Arsenal moved stadium. Because you you forget, we all forget, you know, it's different for, for Man United. And actually Man City, I think, moved before they were successful. So you sort of didn't really notice in a way. But, you know, if Chelsea want to move, that's going to be a kerfuffle. Maybe they'll manage that because of the amount of money they've got. But... You know, Tottenham have got a move. Well, what's that going to do to them? That's going to decimate them. Bankrupt them, hopefully. Yeah, and, and, you know, West Ham are going to move. Look at the cost of that already. And we all forget, but, you know, a lot of the the, the teams, a lot of the clubs are still playing in ancient stadia, and they will have to move. Because when we build a new stadium, it holds 60,000. Manchester United holds, what is it, 75,000 now? Yeah. And... um, are Liverpool still planning to move? They, they talk about Stanley. Stanley. Yes, they are, I believe. Yeah, well, how much is that going to cost them? And I think we've all, we, we've slightly forgotten, you know, that Arsenal were a club worth £300 million that borrowed £400 million to build a new stadium. And that's in London, not in Liverpool. You know, the land is much more expensive. We borrowed more than our club is worth. 
What business does that? I mean, it was a very, very precarious thing to do. And before he's been a manager, I think, first and foremost, Wenger has been a master economist, to be honest, during this period. And I don't think anybody really realises that. Now, I'm not saying the football couldn't have been better, but I suspect he's just been incredibly distracted. Good. Chase? Oh, right, sorry. I was muggled with it. I was just the oh, Keep up. Um, oh, fair enough. I, you, <laughs> no, I, was, I was enjoying what you're seeing. Um, <laughs> Nicola Thiso. Oh, Thiso, I think. I, I'm sorry. I I'm, can't pronounce his name properly. I do can't apologize. pronounce most things properly. BA of Tiger. Um, your favourite Arsenal game in the last 10 years, Matt? My favourite Arsenal game in the last 10 years? Ooh, that's an interesting one. It's a little more than 10 years ago, but I wonder if you'll let me have it. When no, uh, it's no, a, well, well, I think it's a bit more than 10 years ago. Let's have a think. It is. It's about, it was slightly more, but, I'll, but, but I'm going to ask you to grant it to me. Go on it's, then, because it's... Carnu so, got that 15-minute hat-trick in the last 15 minutes <laughs> again against Chelsea. And that last goal he scored from a seemingly impossible angle and seeing Bergkamp shine his boots... I think that, that would probably go down as my favourite. That was magic. Oh, that was indeed. Uh, and it was pouring down with rain that day as well, which I yeah. think might have helped the situation. Um, well, having said that, there was a fabulous nil-nil against Stoke. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually at a nil-nil with Wimbledon at Highbury and I fell asleep. The only time oh, oh. in all those games I fell asleep and I think I had the better deal of it all. Right, OK, uh... It's covering ground we've covered a little bit, but this is from friend of the pod, Ellis Mel, says, what's Wenger's biggest strength and what's his biggest weakness? Um, He seems to be quite stubborn. Um, uh, Well, his strength, I think, is probably getting a bargain. And his weakness, I think, is getting a bargain. Uh, And the example would be, you know, getting Vieira for three and a half million, uh, getting Henri for what now we realise is a bargain, 10 million. Uh, Pires for seven and a half, and and obviously, you know, Anelka for what was it? Nothing. Five and a half. half yeah. yeah, Fabregas for six hundred thousand or whatever it was, and getting these huge fees. That's the strength. The weakness, of course, is is waiting around for the Shamak free transfer when <laughs> you know when actually he wasn't a player to wait around for, let alone whether we pay for him or not. You know, that was a weakness, and I think. You know, thinking, oh, well, I'll stick with Bentner because we all knew, but we actually, we, I will say Bentner had the talent, definitely, but he didn't, he wasn't the complete package and, and, and didn't quite work. Um, and, you know, waiting around and, and, you know, so still having that eye on, on the bargain. And, you know, it remains to be seen if Sonogo will, will, you know, will come good. We, we want him to come good, don't we? Um, uh, so I'd say, I'd say his sort of watchfulness, his 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 sort of obsession with um, f- being frugal is both his strength and weakness. Yeah. Go on, then, Jace. Right. Um, along the same lines as the previous Facebook question from Dean Platts, your favourite Arsenal memory? Um, I mean, it's so obvious to say you know, May the 26th, 1989, isn't it? And so if you don't say it, you'd be lying because that is still the memory. And, and I remember watching it and, uh, at, uh, what was I, 15 years old at the home of my brother's friend and there were four of us there, one Liverpool fan and three Arsenal. And, <laughs> and, and getting in the car straight after the match and driving to Highbury. And... Um, and and so when you see the end of uh, Fever Pitch, the movie, and that sort of spontaneous street party outside the marble halls, well, I was at the real thing. I, I wondered maybe some of you were as well. But that was quite something that night. Uh, so so that 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 memory, that memory. Funnily enough, you know when when Thomas scored in the 90th minute, as crazy as we all went, I still thought Liverpool were going to score. Oh, After yeah. that, you know, we all forget that. We all forget that actually there were another three, two or three, four minutes of injury time to play after that goal. And Liverpool did have an attack. And I think it was Thomas himself who very calmly took the ball out of them in defence in, in, in the way that none of Graham's players usually did. It's quite a Wenger thing to do. 
But you forget that after that goal, we hadn't won the match, you know. We still had to defend. And um, that, yeah, that moment. And, of course, obviously the moment when 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 Arsenal beat Everton uh, uh, to win the, the, the in 98 and Tony Adams closing his... <sighs> Closing his eyes and putting his, you know, would you believe it? Putting his head up to the sky after the season he'd had, after the period he'd had, you know, the comeback from all, you know, struggling with his demons. And that that moment was quite, was quite beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, I would say. Yeah, beautiful. You forget about all the the, the backstories, don't you? You know. Well, backstories are what make football. I mean, I mean, I can't, I can't watch. You know, I live in the US and I and I try and watch MLS football, but I can't watch it because I don't know any of the backstories, and it just so I don't care. I don't care, and I watch. I try, honestly, even when I was trying to watch like Barca Real Madrid, and I don't know enough about the players. You know, I know about some of them, obviously we all do, but I just don't know the the narrative in the same way. And it's you know, I was not a football fan at all. And I started collecting Panini football stickers when I was nine. And that's when I became a fan because I could watch the games and say, oh, there's Alan Brazil and he plays for Spurs and he used to play for, I don't know, whoever it was, Ipswich or something. And suddenly I'd realised the significance of that, you know, player playing against his old club. And, and suddenly the narrative would form of, of the sort of musical chairs of it all. And, oh, he used to play there and now he plays here. And and, and without that, I think football is, is, is just... You know, you know when um, you know you get people who go, "Oh, why do you like football?" You know, it's just sort of people kicking a pig's bladder around and all that. It's such a stupid thing to say, but there's an element of truth in it. It is the stories around football that we love so much. So, so in a way, that moment of Tony Adams scoring that goal, you know, it wasn't the first goal in the match, was it? No. Wasn't it the last? Was it the last goal in the match? Even I it think was it was. We'd already won by then. There was no drama, but it was, what you got was the moment of utter peace on a man's face just and you realize that he you knew that he was in the swan song of his career so you knew here is a man who can finally enjoy this moment and that was the expression on his face was of just he understood what that moment meant because so many of those kids michael thomas was so young and you look at mario gertz and you think well do you know what this even means you know when you score this goal but with adams in that moment he knew exactly what the significance of that moment was and that's why i think it was so beautiful yeah, yeah. I, I, when the crowd started singing E R E R to the donkey noises, yeah, it just, you know, it was just two fingers up to the world, wasn't it? it was Alex was ironic, darling. It was wonderful. <laughs> Danny, I was there for that game. That still goes down as my favourite ever game and my favourite ever goal. Yeah, and it yeah. makes makes me feel old and and quite emotional. Right, my last question from Nicholas Marquez. Which real life Arsenal character is most similar to a character that you've played and why? Um interest. We should have given you these beforehand so you can have a little bit more time to think about it. Well I, I I'm trying to think. Yes, that's uh I'm trying to think. Well um mm, interesting. I'm trying to think of the little Britain characters for a start. We've got Bubbles. Who's <laughs> sort of rather wonderful. Um and I suppose Paul Merson was like Bubbles with, with his love of champagne. So let's leave it there, shall we? I, I reckon, right, let me just jump in. I reckon it was Andreas Chavin and he was Andy Pipkin. Because when they asked him to track back, he went, I don't like it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Do you remember that game? Didn't Arshavin score four against Liverpool? That was an amazing yeah, game. he did. Yeah. Stunning. Was... We were trying to think on uh, on Twitter the other night because uh, when one of the blokes scored four goals in the Champions League, we were saying, well, two is a brace, three is a hat-trick, and what's a four? And someone said we should call it an Arshavin. We should. But then, do you remember Baptista against Liverpool got four as well? Yeah, in the League Cup. Yeah, and he was still shit. <laughs> <laughs> what a waste them, right? Julio. Right. Um, right. right then, is that all the yep. Twitter and oh, Facebook that, questions? What, have we asked the Jordan Webb one? No, we haven't. Right, Matt, Jordan Webb's asked, which Arsenal player is more suited to play the only gay in the village? Um, interesting. Um, well, I thought Callum Chambers looks very groomed, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not making any... Uh, I think, I don't know, if you believe the rumours, Freddie Lundberg, otherwise... Um, <laughs> I suppose maybe Ramsey because he probably comes. He probably is from the closest to Clandawi Brevi, isn't he? So we'd have to say Aaron Ramsey just for for Welsh reasons. 
Thank you very much. We did I have some. That. We did have someone ask. Uh, I send a question in. What was it like directing Star Wars? But we thought we wouldn't bother <laughs> asking you that because it's a bit stupid. <laughs> no, I did actually direct Star Wars. Was it you? Yes, and I don't know why this interview hasn't been filled with Star Wars questions, and I, I, I think it's rather strange you've overlooked it, but oh. yeah, next time. next oh, time. If I was you, Matt, I'd be angry, and I'd want answers. <laughs> well, um, I'm a very forgiving person, you're fine. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Hopefully you'll come back at some point in the future. Um, like right, our, our final question comes from a competition winner. As you all may know, um, we've been running a competition over the last week and a half, um, asking you, which is Matt's current favourite Arsenal footballer? Matt, would you like to give us the answer? Well, I have to say uh, Theo Walcott. Fantastic. And out of the, I think it was about 15 or 16 answers, they were all pulled from a hat. Well, the winner was pulled from a hat, and he's, he joins us now. Um, and on Twitter, you might know him as at Tal the Um So, Tal? Evening all, how are you doing? Hello, Tal. How's it going, Matt? Very well, thank you. How are you, Tal? Yes, very well, thank you. Really enjoying the podcast. Let me be the first to uh, wish you a hearty congratulations um, for winning the competition. And uh, part of the competition was to be able to ask Matt a question live on the podcast. So, And he also won a speedboat. Yes, he won a speedboat. Or Danny's <laughs> caravan. Mm. Lovely. Not much use for a speedboat in East London, trust me. <laughs> If uh, if you've got something that um, well, any of us haven't asked yet, I know we've just fired questions at Matt for like the last hour, so fire away. OK, um, Matt, you talked about your best ever um, Arsenal games, memories, etc. What about your worst Arsenal memory? Oh, I can tell you, actually, and there have been a few. I think the worst memory of an Arsenal game has to be that semi-final in 99 against Man United. Uh, that was incredibly painful. Uh, you know, missing the penalty, the manner of losing that match. And, and I, I was genuinely depressed for quite a few days. That was one. And I think the other one, because I was only about 14 at the time, was um, the Littlewoods Cup final in 1988 when we lost to Luton Town and I was there. I was there and, too. Yeah, yeah and I'd never... there too. You were there. And I'd never seen Arsenal in a cup final at Wembley. Um, I'd seen them in the... Uh, I feel like I'd seen them in the... Um, there was some game against Tottenham where we beat them 4-0, a friendly, a pre-season friendly where Marwood got a couple. But to actually see Arsenal in a cup final at Wembley, I was very, very excited. And, and we forget because we make jokes about the League Cup now. But back then... I'm pretty sure that, that yes, uh, 88, we... Oh, no, well, there wouldn't have been the ban, but I don't think... We didn't have such a... You know, there wasn't the Champions League or anything like that, so European football was something in the distance, and we didn't really have much of a presence in European football in that period. So so winning the, the League Cup would have been a very big deal. And we'd won it the season before, and we were the clear favourites to win it, and arguably we had a better squad than we'd had the year before and the team was more regimented and more drilled and we were just we we I think we thought we were going to walk it against Luton didn't we and and we were winning we were losing and then we were winning and we thought we thought that was it and then um Dibble saved the penalty is that right was yeah. it Winterburn's penalty yeah. yeah he did yeah yeah and then was it Steen who got that very late goal or Danny Wilson got the late goal yeah I think and, it was after Gus Caesar trod on the ball that's right. Yeah. Yes, of course. Because because O'Leary wasn't fit, was he? And um, it was just uh, it was heartbreaking. And I was 14 years old and I would bought a flag. Um, uh, and it, while I was celebrating, the the tip of the flag, the stick went into my eye. So I was in agony. And basically I was standing on the terraces at Wembley. And when Arsenal scored, uh, there was such celebration that I got moved and I couldn't breathe. It was it was really terrifying for me. And so much so that when Arsenal were 2-1 up and we had the penalty, I was hoping we would miss the penalty because I couldn't take another goal celebration. Uh, but what I wasn't planning on was Luton to get an equaliser and then score the winner. And leaving Wembley, having lost a game. The other one, of course, I remember I was at Wembley for was, was the FA Cup semi-final. I think it was the first time they played it at Wembley. When uh, I think we lost three one, did we? 
Oh, Mercer 91. scored for us, and um, yeah, Gaza uh, uh, and Lineker scored for Tottenham. Did we lose three one that match? Yeah, we did. Yeah, and I remember, I remember sitting behind the goal where uh, uh, Gaza scored. Um, was it a free kick he scored in that game? Was that ninety one? Something like that. Yeah, and yeah, and and of course we thought we were going to do the double. And I remember uh, all the Tottenham fans. Uh, cheering and actually I went to that match with my mum and I sat next to her and when the Tottenham goal went in my mum said oh no well Arsenal are never going to win now are they oh dear like that like and I was going mum like that I was really annoyed but that was a that was a really heartbreaking match as well basically being a football fan is shit isn't it (laughs) yeah I completely agree I totally agree with you about 99 as well. That's still my worst memory as an Arsenal fan. 99, yeah. I remember thinking I need counselling after this match. I need Mm -hmm. counselling. And I was watching the match in a bar and gradually the bar filled as the match went on. And by the end of the game, from there being three or four of us Arsenal fans at the beginning, it was just suddenly loads of neutral people and everyone cheering when Man United won. And it just was the most miserable experience. Just miserable. Yeah, I totally agree. Oh, thanks for that, Matt. Pleasure. Thanks very much. All the best. Cheers. Right. What we do is the way we normally end the podcast is by giving our predictions for the Sunderland game. Well, or the next game. Um, So I'd like some predictions for our world famous predictions league. So, Danny, I'm going to start with you. Oh dear, as I run this and as I edit the website, I'm the person who messes this up when I finished bottom the last time. I'm absolutely useless. So I'm going to say it's going to be a three-all draw. And the first goal scorer is going to be Santi Cathola. Fantastic. And Matt, seeing as you are a celebrity, you get the second go at this. Um, 2-0 Arsenal. And I think it's going to be the first goal scorer is going to be an own goal. Oh, uh, no one's done that yet. No. Oh, cheeky. That is very cheeky. And the I listeners think... are top of the league at the moment. I think the listeners are going to get two goes this week. We can't have two. We can have a go, but only one of them will count. Oh, you are such. It's a... not me, is it? They can't have two. They get. They could get both right and then get ten points and win. Run away with the league. You're a hard ass. Well, Terry can have a go, but we'll use Matt's one. Oh, Jesus Christ. Well, Jones. Matt's a celebrity, easy. Terry's just a person with a shoebox full of We've got to give Tell a go. <laughs> he can have a go. Tell, what's, what's your score, Tell? Come on. Right, I'm going to go for a good old-fashioned 1-0 to the Arsenal, and I'm going to go Ramsey first for the goal scorer. Ooh, superb. Jace? I, I, 3-0 to the Arsenal. Ram to score first. And Dom? Uh, I'll go 1-0 to Arsenal and Sanchez. Fantastic. Kate? Oh, 3-1. And, oh, who's that? Chambers. Ooh! I'm no good at this predicting, Lark, except for if we're playing and I get one of my premonitions. I'm going for it this year. I want that trophy. Has Jeff got his trophy yet? It's been posted um, on Saturday by Chris Carpenterin, and uh, so it should be any day. It should be there by now. He hasn't um, said. Matt, can we yeah. just get you to say quickly, Carpenter out, yeah. Barbican Pirates are rubbish. Carpenter out, Barbican Pirates are rubbish. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm going for a 4-1 Arsenal with Welbeck to be the first scorer. Um, Danny, are we going to do some shout-outs tonight just before we go? Well, if we can start off with Matt and he can tell us of all the famous people that he likes and then shout them all out. I don't have anybody because I don't like anybody. No, oh. I, don't, I don't have anyone to shout out. Nothing. No one. Is everyone, there any... everyone can can do one. Have you got any mates that are famous people that are, that are Arsenal fans that, that aren't known to be Arsenal fans? Tim, Tim Burton uh, uh, has a soft spot for Arsenal. Oh, he's, he's very good. Yeah. How about his wife? Does she like football? No, I think she. I think I, I'm. I'm not sure. I haven't had that conversation with her. But Tim. Tim is definitely. But I think he has a soft spot for Spurs as well now. Oh, you've oh, just gone and ruined it. Yeah. Yeah. All that hope. Um, <laughs> so, Danny, come on, give us a shout out. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm going to Andre Arshavin. Wenger okay. ruined his career. I'm sorry. Jace. We miss you. Um. Here we go. Then I tell you, we got John Colton. Um. 
at John underscore Colton. He's with the Triangle uh, Magoonas podcast. They're great. They're a good bunch of guys there. So I like John, top man. Uh, Dom? I don't have any shout outs, but why don't we let Matt give a little cheeky plug to his uh, new show that's coming out? Yes. That he's working on at the moment. That's very. Oh, what a lovely man you are. My new program, my new television show is called Pompey Do. And it's six episodes, and it's a new sitcom, and it's my comeback, hopefully. And the entire series is in gibberish, so I've no idea what anyone's going to make of it. But there are very many Arsenal references in the show littered around. So if you if you watch it, you'll spot loads of uh, obscure Arsenal players being name-checked. Superb. Kate? Okay. Um, my shout-out this week is for an ex-triangle gooner who is Jason Schrader who is at Colonial Cannon because he's awesome and Tal um, just the one um, at Vintage Footy um, they post a lot of old photos from years gone by of old games and grounds and all the rest of it and the photos are just really interesting to look at so give them a follow and mine is at Indy AFC and that's I. N D I E A F C. Um, by far and away, one of the best female gooners on Twitter. So go and give her a follow. She's lovely. Um, so all that's left really is to thank all the guests on tonight. Matt, thank you. You've been absolutely superb. Just like when Rob Beckett was on, I've sat here with a massive smile on my face. What were we going to um, say there? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you've been absolutely super. Thank you so much. Well, usually I say it was nice to get out of the house, but I did it all from the comfort of my own sofa. It was a pleasure, and good luck uh, with the rest of the podcast. And uh, uh, let me know if you want me to come and darken your doors uh, another time. I'll be there. Oh, we'd absolutely love that. Hopefully, you know, we've uh, next time you come on, we'll be uh, award winners. We've got the FBAs on November the 13th, which we're up against um, a couple of Liverpool pods, um, uh, a, a pod from the scum. Um, I won't say their name. Coventry, you Wolves, a ladies yeah. one and a general yeah. football one. So if you see something from our podcast account saying click this link, give us a vote, please, please give us a vote. A vote for us is a vote for Arsenal. So we'll do. We'll do. I, have, I just remembered who I should give a shout out to if I may. Go Far on. Then. All the gay gooners. There oh. you go. Someone, someone did ask a question about that. They said, what were your thoughts on the gay Guna flag at, at, at the Emirates? I think it's wonderful. I like all this inclusion. Yeah, it's good. Everyone. Yeah, I think it's, it's the way forward, you know, and uh, I think it's lovely. Yes. You should all have a big hug about it. Yes. Group hug. Oh. So, that's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll, we'll stop recording or take our tops off and have a cuddle. Hey, no touching my body or okay. my, uh, my ears. I don't like it. At least we've managed to get through this podcast without sending a nude picture of yourself to a famous celebrity. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Rob Beckett liked that picture of me naked in the bath. That was eighteen and a half stone of hunky man. No, I've been, I've been I've um, been I've been looking at it throughout actually. <laughs> <laughs> Are you voiced? It's given you the inspiration to oh. carry on. It has. Righty ho, I shall see you all soon. God all bless. Right. Cheers, Matt. Cheers, Matt. Bye. 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 So that was a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Thank you so much for listening and keep it Arsenal. Good night. We were talking to Matt Lucas before the podcast started for about 25 minutes and some of the things he said were really interesting. But of all the, the pre-pod chat, this is one of the bits that we thought you would like to hear. So here you go. You know what? This really this really weird thing happened once. I, 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 I Because of Darren, I watched the match in Thierry Henry's box and it was... It was the game where uh, um, we we Adebayo scored for Tottenham against us, and then we went and scored about five goals or something against Spurs. Was it five two? Yeah, five two. Theo yeah, Walcott scored off. two. Yeah, and he got sent off. It was amazing, right? Mm-hmm. So I ended up watching that match just by chance in 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 Thierry Henry's box, right? Just it was just a really weird thing because I was having dinner with Darren in the week, and he just said to me. Oh, do you want to come to the game? So I went to the game, and then this magical thing happened, which was Thierry said, uh, meet me after the game, to me, right? And then he took me into the changing room after the match. It was just surreal. He took me on the pitch, we had a photo, and then he took me in the changing room and started introducing me to the players. And then Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain said, oh, I love you, can we have a photo? 
So then we did a photo and I'm just stood there thinking, this is the weirdest thing. And I have, I have, you know, I obviously working in TV and films and stuff like that, you meet amazing people, you find yourself in amazing situations. But I don't think I've ever, ever would have dreamed that that would happen. Um, and actually at one point, our shoving was naked, but I didn't, I made a point of not looking. So I thought that would be creepy. Yeah, I was completely starstruck. And, um, uh, but then weirdly, so were a couple of the players. So it was just this odd thing. <laughs> but, but I was, uh, honestly, I, I, I don't think I could have ever imagined that you would watch the game and then, then Thierry Henry would take you onto the pitch and then, and then into the changing room. And I felt like the lucky, I felt like a sort of lucky little boy, really. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it was one of those days where sometimes you're out and you're having a really bad day and just like anyone does and then somebody stops you and you know you're trying to get to the bank before it closes and you get delayed because people come up to you and talk to you and you just think oh sometimes this is a real pain and then you have to say no because that's the you know that's one side of being on telly but the other side of it is that something really magical happens so I just whenever I'm having a bad day because there's a creepy photographer waiting outside the house then I remind myself that actually that's the flip side, but the other side was I got to, to you know, go on the pitch with Thierry Henry after the game. And I know I should just be like, yeah, he's a normal bloke, they're all normal blokes, but I think I'm like anyone, really. You know, I think I'm, I'm a fan like everyone else, and I have to pinch myself. Because he truly is, I think he's the greatest Arsenal player anyone, any of us will ever see. I yeah, don't think, yeah. we're, even better than Bergkamp, I think. I mean, and don't, don't get me wrong, I think Bergkamp, Adams... Vieira, you know, they were all sublime and uh, I was a, a little bit too young to see Brady play and, you know, we all have our favourites, uh, Rocky, but I don't think any of us will ever see anyone like Thierry at the club again because I just think he was, I think at his peak he was the best player in the world. <laughs> 